Okay, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me, and I'm looking forward to telling you about how um, social behavior influences social status. And this is the uh, story of, uh, of looking across all levels and trying to understand actually how social behavior influences the brain at multi-levels. So most animals, as you know, have a social ranking system, usually that is solved by fighting and set up by fighting and then maintained either by grooming or by some kind of other mechanisms. And what I'm going to do is tell you about how we look at the consequences of social status on the brain. And for that, you need to have a, an animal model, which really their life is focused entirely on sex and food. This also explains why working on this model leads a lot of undergraduates to work in my, life, my lab, because of course, <laughs> It's a model of their systems as well. Um, you need to be able to look at many animals simultaneously in a natural situation, and you need to measure at all the levels of analysis we're interested in. So this African cichlid fish meets these criteria, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about their natural social life. So first I'll talk about their social life, then how social status influences reproduction, how do they actually know about their status, and uh, how is that social information transduced into these cellular and molecular changes in the brain. And here's what they look like. So at the bottom is this dominant territorial male. And up here might be a female, but it might also be a non-dominant or non-territorial male. So that's, this is how this works. They live in Africa, in uh, Central Africa, Lake Tanganyika in particular. And this has uh, been studied primarily by scientists. This is Max Pohl, who was, when the uh, Europeans were helping the Africans uh, remove all of the valuable assets. Uh, they sent biologists down to identify what was worth stealing, and he was sent, he was sent to look at what could be harvested from Lake Tanganyika, and he, this is his major research tool called the depth charge. So he blew up large volumes of water and then collected the animals and brought them back to Belgium where he wrote books about them. Uh, not a lot of information about the behavior, but I did know at least where to go and look for them initially. And they live actually in these shore pools along the edge of the lake. And this is a shore pool, um, number six, and <clears throat> I'll show you what they actually do. In this pool, I put in bamboo stakes to mark where they were. These little circles mark a dominant territorial male who spends his time digging this hole in the, in the substrate and then trying to lure females into this. Now, this particular pool had 1,200 animals, 600 males, 600 females. But you'll notice only about 60 of the males, or about 10%, had these territories, which are guarding the only food resource. So they have a big resource to spend, and they're trying to spend it on getting matings. The non-dominant males have a real problem, because they have to eat here. So they pretend they're females. They go and let themselves be lured into the territory. They act feminine, are colored like females. They eat vigorously, and then he says, let's go into my grotto and spawn. They say, well, you know, I've got other plans. And they, <laughs> they swim away, and they actually do this repeatedly and fool these males. The females in this species, as in all species we know about, are completely in control. They can go into this territorial area, choose a male based on moves, color, brightness, size of his territory, amount of food, eat, and then actually spawn with the male. So you have an easy time identifying with um, rats and kindergartners, but it's hard to know what it would be like if you were a fish. So here's, here's what it's like. I'll show you this video. Um, this is a dominant male who's doing OK, but he's being watched by this guy who will now come in and try to take away a piece of his territory. So here he is, no colors. He's fighting with this dominant male really pretty vigorously. They're going at it. And you'll slowly see this guy realize he's getting the upper fin, as it were. And he'll turn on his eye bar. And pretty soon, this guy will recognize he's kind of lost. He hasn't lost everything, but he's lost about this much of the territory. So from here on out, this guy owns that part of his territory and will use it to set up a place to breed with females. So he's just made a major step forward, and you'll see why this is so important in his life. Now, spawning is also troublesome for this species. The females are uh, mouth brooders. They pick up the eggs and uh, <coughs> brood them in their mouths. And that causes a real problem for fertilization, but it's been solved by uh, the female laying the eggs, picking them up in her mouth, and then when she has in her mouth, this male who's just spawned with her has to get the sperm onto those eggs. So he uses these anal fin spots to fool her into thinking she's missed some eggs. She'll, he'll swim in front of her, show her those spots, put the sperm on those eggs, and she'll pick up those sperm and fertilize the eggs in her mouth. And then he says, how about laying some more eggs? And she says, uh, no. Uh, so 
and they then raise these young for two weeks in their mouths. So this is a model system that's really to die for. These animals live at a 12-12 light-dark cycle at an equal temperature lake. So we can bring this whole social system back and look at it in the lab. And there are two what we call socially regulated phenotypes. The dominant male I've described who are reproductively active, the non-dominant who are not, and they have a lot of differences. And this is entirely under social control, whether you fall into one category or the other. So how does this influence reproduction? We can raise brothers either as dominant or non-dominant males and then look at various things in size-matched males. You might want to guess who grew up as a dominant male. This is the guy here. These are his testes, and they are full of mature sperm. But the other thing that happens is, and in this species, as in all vertebrates, this is controlled by a part of the brain, the preoptic area that has GnRH cells. These are GnRH cells colored with an antibody. And so you can see them, and you'll notice something puzzling, which is that in the T males, they've gotten eight times larger in volume. So all that they did, we did was rear them separately in different conditions, and they got different sized uh, brain cells. So we now <coughs> developed a technique where we can convert them from T to NT by putting them into, a, this guy's doing fine up here, we put him in here, and he'll actually immediately turn off his colors if these animals are about 10% bigger in size than he is. So they are then down-regulated to a, a prior status. So if they're non-territorial, and this is now soma size, which is a proxy for this peptide, GnRH, which is the major regulatory peptide that controls reproductive competence in all of us. So these, the GnRH that they have will work in you, and theirs will work in, in them. Yours will work in them, sorry. So that NT males have small cells, the T males have large cells. But if you make a man shrink from T to NT, his cells will shrink. And if you let him become a dominant male, those cells will grow. And it's not just the cells that change size, but they also change their dendritic extent. So here they are in an NT male. These are the dendrites um, mapped. They're much more elaborate here. We now know they connect to one another in the T male. They, pr they produce a syncytium and they fire synchronously. So there are those changes that occur as well, and it's under social regulation. Going from NT to T, this whole thing can take as little as two and a half days. Going from T to NT, the males try to hang on to their gonads by pretending they're still dominant, and they can do that for about two weeks, but then it's over. They've got to go back to the status. OK, so it also regulates something that we've just heard about, um, stress. So NT males are high in cortisol levels, and T males are low. And of course, anybody who's read about cortisol or studied it knows that this should lead to them having basically liquid brains, because they would have such high cortisol levels. So we wondered how this was solved. We cloned the cortisol receptors and found that one of them has an insert that makes it much less effective. This is the, a, called a splice variant. doesn't matter what it's called, but it makes it less effective. When you become an NT male, you take this particular splice variant and you install it in your brain. So you basically are reducing the way you listen to the cortisol. So this is a reaching from the social system right down into the receptor expression in a key set of cells. So what do they actually know? They are a little bit like kindergartners, and their behavior is contingent on other animals. And this is seen in primates, and this is one of the first examples in, in, in a fish. This is the dominant male, and when he's in his shelter, it's shown here in purple, and when these black bars appear, he's coming out and attacking other males. And he'll do that uh, regularly. This is sort of his line of business. So he basically keeps everybody else in this tank uh, sort of under control. <coughs> now, males that are intermediate males will actually uh, do something different. They're ones who are on the make. And you'll notice they only come out when he can't see them because he's in his shelter. So a little bit like kindergarten playgrounds or faculty meetings, basically there's some kind of attention hierarchy where animals keep track of who's watching you. Um, kind of scary. They do this actually in, in real time with a high resolution. They're not just generally watching. They're watching with a cross correlation of about uh, 0.5 seconds. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that you might wonder how they figure out who to fight with. Well, we've recently shown that they have something called transitive inference. So we, they can infer dominance rank just by observing other animals, which is a really a wonderful trait. You all have it. You got it when you were about three through natural processes. And it means that you can tell what's going to happen uh, by just observing. You don't need to fight with everybody. So for the fish, it's important. And the way we study this is pretty interesting. We actually staged fights. We trained fish to either be um, beating A beats B beats C beats D beats E, or they're all equal. 
And you do that by having this animal watch these two guys fight. You stage the fight by dropping B, who used to live here, into A's territory after stressing him for a few minutes by holding him in your hand, and then he always loses. So you then might ask the question, how would B, would B beat D? This is the, the key question. Can you imagine that this fish would know that B was going to beat D, having not, never seen them fight directly? So you can't give fish questionnaires. So what you have to do is use their knowledge, our knowledge of their behavior. So we reconfigure the test arena and show that they will always go and sit by the weaker fish. And it's actually D. And even in a novel arena, they will do that. And this was an undergraduate who did this work, which appeared on the cover of Nature. He was pretty pleased by that. But it's one of the things where you kind of forget. If you have a fish tank, you can't imagine that all this is going on. But in these fish, they're really very clever about this. So um, the other thing that we did was begin to wonder about how females are using observation. So choosing losers makes females anxious. And I'll show you what that means. Uh, here's a female watching two males. We discovered that these females were watching males repeatedly. So we did the following experiment. We had a female who was gravid, meaning about to lay eggs, choose between two males. Then in a sort of evil step, she had to watch these two males fight. And either her chosen mate won or lost. And now we want to peer into the brain and ask what they thought about this. So we uh, slice and punch the brain, something you can't do with kindergartners, fortunately. And we can look at a, a, a probe called an immediate early gene, which is the proxy for neural activation. And we do uh, PCR, which looks at the expression of these, of these genes. And fish brains, stretched out a little bit, have all the parts that you have. And these are the parts we looked at, particularly this area that's related to reproduction, and this which is related to anxiety and fear conditioning. So here is that brain again. Here is CFOS, which is the name of the immediate early gene we used. And here's what happens. If she sees her chosen mate win, she turns on her entire reproductive axis. She's really ready to mate with him. If he loses, she turns on the uh, lateral septum, which is for processing anxiety. So she basically changes the brain expression in response to this particular uh, paradigm. And of course, females are not stupid. They never make the same, cho same choice twice. So if they've seen the fight, they will always, uh, if they see the preferred male loses, they will always switch to the other male. So they're, they're really very precocious in thinking about how this all works. Similarly, males, this won't be as big a surprise. Uh, they care about who's watching them. Um, and basically, we can show this by actually measuring how hard two males fight when they're being watched by, for example, a larger male. They don't fight as hard. By a size match male, a little less. And by a smaller male, a little less. When they're being watched by a gravid female, they fight really hard. So they're trying to impress the environment. And I think this is something that we haven't talked about at this meeting yet, but somebody might, which is how much do the observers know about the social situation? How much are they using this information to, to calibrate what they're going to do? So here's the harder question, which is, how is social information actually changed into cellular molecular changes? So we decided to do this experiment, which is um, we have a social environment that Reduces, produces a phenotype that changes the reproductive capacity. So we decided to perform what we call now a bullyectomy. Uh, we remove the dominant <laughs> male, and we can change them from a non-dominant to a dominant male. So there's a social group. Um, they have to be in these social areas. These are, however, barriers, so they're just together in here. We go in with an infrared viewer, remove the bully, and at sunrise, this guy wakes up, and he sees the bully is gone. I could have used this as a child. It didn't appear at that time, but here. Uh, here's what happens. Here is the dominant male, and the guy with the tag is the non-dominant male, and these others are females. So here's shelter back here. You can't see it very well in this uh, image, but he's going to try to lure this female back to his shelter. She won't come back with him, so he chases her. Then he'll go back and clean up his shelter, thinking maybe it was messy, and that's why she didn't spawn with him. <laughs> then he'll fight through the tank, and not that guy won't fight with him. So he comes back and chases this guy. And basically, his full-time activity, here he is fighting with his neighbor through the glass. His full-time activity is basically harassing this crowd over here, or trying to get a female to And they're looking out the window, hoping he won't notice that they're still there. <laughs> um, so here's what happens the morning when this guy wakes up and finds the bully is gone. So you watch, this is in real time. He notices the guy's gone, and this is recognition of his social opportunity. He chews on the shelter. He would never go near it when the guy was present. He's already turned on his eye bar, and he is getting ready to uh, become a dominant male. And he does this extremely rapidly, behaviorally. Now, we all know he has no sperm, but he will still try to spawn with and 
uh, mate with these females. And before you get too um, uh, accommodated to this wonderful new change in his life, we have to kill him and look at his brain. And we basically, mapping his behavior shows that he actually acts just like a normal dominant male becoming dominant. And we did this first experiment trying to figure out what happens in his brain. And we could show that there's a change in 20 minutes after his initial dominant behavior, there's a change in EGR1, another one of the immediate early genes. This one has another property. It's a transcription factor for GnRH. So within minutes, and we now have uh, made this much earlier, we know that within five minutes, there's a gene expression change in this set of cells. And that set of cells are responsible for upregulating his possibility of becoming a dominant male who has sperm. And we now are taking these cells out with single cell extraction and are able to show that this whole realm of genetic changes that are occurring in these cells which are in response to recognizing social opportunity. So this kind of reach across these dimensions is really kind of striking to me that we can find these changes so rapidly. And this just shows you the, the, the actual data where these are the GnRH cells and this is the in situ showing the expression of the gene. So one of the questions that has, I've been spurred to look at, thanks to the CIFAR work, has been whether there's DNA, DNA methylation changes that might also underlie or be part of this. So this is part of a project that's using both DNA methylation and microRNAs, but I'll just talk about the DNA methylation. So we devised this experiment. We put together two males who'd never been dominant, and of course they will fight, and we put them in a tank where only one territory could be sustained. And when they finish fighting, one will become dominant and one will not. So we then repeated this by injecting one animal with a demethylating agent and one with a hypermethylating agent. So let me show you what this looks like. These are the data. This is a dominant male who becomes dominant by acting more dominant, as you can see, and a non-dominant male who stops acting dominant and basically does nothing in response. So this is the way the natural uh, process unfolds. Now if we look at the methionine injection, which is methylating, we will see uh, the dominant animals, almost anyone who gets injected becomes dominant and the non-dominant animals look like they, you saw them before. So the, the changing in the global methylation state of the genome seems to have driven this pathway. That's pretty interesting, but if you put in zebulurine, which is a, a blocker of the methylene process, then those animals become non-dominant. So now we can see that this might be either a cause or a consequence of becoming dominant. And we're now doing sequencing, and the early data suggests there are a handful of genes, maybe as few as 600, that are changing in response to either zebulurine or methionine, and in co correspondingly in, in return to the, uh, the way in which we've manipulated them. In this case, we're just doing it now in a natural situation. The promise here is that because we have this social ascent paradigm, we'll be able to use that to look at the onset of methylation changes as the animal goes through the consequences of kind of becoming a dominant male. So, in conclusion, I think it's pretty clear that the behavior changes the brain in real time, and the dynamic of, of these uh, H. Bertoni allows you to see this in a really dramatic fashion. And these are experiments that mimic what happens in the wild. They're actually in large colonies, and we always look at many animals simultaneously. So we're able to say that it really does reflect how it works in the world. Um, the other thing that I think comes out of this is that they are collecting social information. We are all the time doing this as well. You walk into a room, you don't need to say who's male, who's female, who's old, who's young, who's likely wealthy, who's not. So they collect this information in exactly the same way, and they use it to control how they're going to behave in certain social cir circumstances. And I think the future of, of that kind of analysis will be to understand how those changes, how recognition of your status, for example, might also influence the way your body responds to your social status. And of course, the social information is getting into the brain much more rapidly than I had ever imagined in a matter of minutes, changing gene expression, changing uh, cortisol receptor expression. So there are many pathways that we're now investigating to see how this happens. How can you get social behavior that so rapidly transduces into changes at many levels, cellular, molecular, and we now even think uh, changes of the DNA methylation as well. So. Uh, in conclusion, is that the aggressive dominant males really have different brain circuits than the non-dominant males, and they're busy building them as they, as they ascend into a new social status. And I have to thank the people who've uh, worked with me. These are the undergraduate lab trip. If you live in California, you get to go to the beach for your lab outing. And uh, my funding agency, I'd be delighted to answer any questions. <laughs>